Good evening, New Beginning Church and my online family and friends. It's just a joy for us to do, do this tonight. We thank you for joining us and we pray that you will click the share button and start a watch party with your family and friends. In this crazy, mixed up world, everyone, whether they are saved or not, longs for peace. And there's a difference between the peace that the world gives and the peace that Jesus gives. Jesus clearly told his disciples when he got ready to leave the earth and go back to his father, that it was going to be rough down here, but don't worry. He said, I am with you. I will never leave you and I am your peace. No matter what is going on in your life, stop and speak the name of Jesus out loud and feel the calmness that you will receive from speaking his name. Know that he is with you and that he is for you even when the storm is raging all around you. There's a quote that says, peace is not the absence of trouble. It is the presence of Christ. So get to know this Jesus so you can have that peace. Let him into your heart and you will experience the peace like you have never dreamed you'd have. Our scriptures tonight will come from John 14 verse 27 and Psalm 119 verse 165 from the New Living Translation. John 14 and 27 reads, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Psalm 119, 165 says, Those who love your instructions have great peace and do not stumble. So in order to grab hold of this peace that John and David are writing about, we have to know Jesus. We have to have a relationship with him. And then we will follow his directions and love his instructions. Let him in today. He'll change your heart. He'll give you a brand new start. He'll turn your life around. All these things can be if you let him in. Let him in today. Let him in today. He'll change your heart. Let him in today. He'll give you a brand new start. Let him in today. He'll turn your
Father God, we thank you now. We magnify you. We glorify you. We lift you, Father God, and we praise you again for giving us another privilege, another chance, another opportunity to come before you. God, we honor you today, Father God, for you are worthy. You are the awesome God. You're the one who watches over us and keeps us. And we thank you for another privilege just to say thank you. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us as we go forth today in your word. Bless your word to fall on good soil. Bless us to be about your business in such a way, Father God, that we will hear from you and we will bless your name. Lord, we ask you to feed us, to give us what we need from the word of God on tonight. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise, allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, and powerful, anointed name of Jesus the Christ we pray, and we ask it all. Amen, and thank God. If we just let him in, let him in, let him in. Yes, Let him in today, and you won't be disappointed. Let him, let him in. Our lesson for tonight will continue in Colossians uh, chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14 is where we are on tonight. I know it's been two weeks since we've gotten together in the book of Colossians. On last week, we dealt with this Thanksgiving moment, and I hope everybody had a very prosperous Thanksgiving and was uh, honoring God and all that God has has done for us and through us. So tonight we're back in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. <clears throat> We're going to talk a little bit more about this new man that God has develop, developed in us. He has blessed us since we've... Uh, come in contact with Jesus, we are no longer the same. Since we are now in Jesus the Christ, we are different. Uh, last time we gathered, we talked about putting off some things. And tonight we're going to talk about putting on some things. We talked about putting off some things. And tonight we're going to talk about putting on some things. I, I told you before that the, the late, <clears throat> the late uh, Nancy Reagan had a statement, and her statement was, was, just say no. The problem with that statement is, as we say no to drugs, we have to find something to say yes to. So Nancy Reagan was right in her plight to tell young people, just say no to drugs. But it fell somewhat short because she did not give them something to say yes to. I submit to you tonight, if you're going to say no to unrighteousness, you have to say yes to righteousness. If you're going to say no to those things that are not of God, you have to say yes to those things that are of God. So uh, last time we met, we talked about pulling off putting off, taking off some things. We talked about pulling off some things. When we look at the previous verses in chapter 3 of Colossians, it talks about pulling off, taking off things, putting those things away. So I want to run a little demonstration by you tonight. You can tell me if it's effective or not. What I have on is a very comfortable coat. I mean, if you see me outside and, and the weather is inclement, I can put this coat on and I can feel a lot better. I can feel good about this coat because it's, it's lining, it's, it's made of good material, it's, it's padded and it's, it's attractive, it's nice. It's a very nice, comfortable coat. It keeps you warm. Not only does it keep, keep you warm, it, it, it dampers the wind. And even uh, the rain does not take over this coat. It is comfortable to me. It is, it is what I like. It is, 
it is it is a a very very a very very comfortable coat that has its way with me, and it it appears to me every time the temperature drop drops as it is right now, and it has it and as it has been this week, I can put on this coat and feel good. But the problem with this coat tonight, it represents the things of the old man. After today, when you see me with this coat on, don't call me the old man, but this coat in this demonstration alone, this coat only represents the old man, the old things in my life. Last time we met, we talked about how we need to put off the old man in the works of the old man. We talked about setting our minds above on things that are above and not those things which are beneath. We talked about setting our minds and our hearts on Christ Jesus. And as we continued through uh, this chapter, beginning at verse 5, we talked about putting to death the members which are of the, on the earth. He began to list the things of the earth, the things of this world, fornication, uncleanness, passions that control us. He says, put off evil desires, covetousness, put off the worship of idols, put off anger, put off wrath, put off malice, put off blasphemy. Put off filthy language out of your mouths. Put off lying. And he talks about in verses 9 and 10, not only should we put off the deeds of the old man, but in verse 10, we have already put on the new man, therefore we ought to put on other things. He talks about us being slaves to the devil and now we ought to be in Christ Jesus. And we ought to be in Christ Jesus because he is all and he is in all. So tonight, this coat represents the deeds of the old man. Paul draws a parallel to putting on clothing and putting off clothing. This parallel is one that's given to us as we grow in this newfound relationship with Jesus Christ. He says, you've gotten comfortable. He says, you like it. He says, just as this coat, he says, this is comfortable to us. It's, it's well lined. It is neatly worn. I can wear it to a social event. I can wear it to a black tie event. I can put it on as I walk in, take it off as I, I walk, walk in, put it on right before I walk out. This is a very comfortable coat to me. But the problem in this demonstration, the problem is this coat represents the old man and its deeds. It represents those list of things that I've just given you. And if you're not seen in one of them that I named, you've seen in the other. If you're not wrestling with one of these problems, I guarantee you, you're wrestling with the other one. I told you before that I wrestle with sin just like you do. Every preacher has his vice that, that he wrestles with. And I'm saying to you today, God wants us to stop wrestling with our stuff and bring our cares to him. He says, two weeks ago, I said to you, he says, put it off. You see, the devil never tempts us. He never tempts us in areas that we can't be tempted. He never tempts us in areas that are not attractive to us. So Paul lines this out in many seminarians call this grave clothes. 
Theologians refer to the old man in the old man's deeds as his grave clothes. So Paul lays out this argument that we are walking around as new men, new women, but we still got our grave clothes on. We got our grave clothes on because we acting like we're not saved. He's talking to this church at Colossae, and he's saying to the church at Colossae, let me just share with you all. You are born again, let me remind you. He says, and because you are born again, the clothing that you're wearing, the deeds that you're doing, you got to put them off. Problem, the problem with, uh, with us is that we like what is comfortable. So this coat is comfortable. I can, I can put it around my neck and make it more comfortable. I can, I can button the top button and make it real comfortable. I, this coat is what I like. I'm trying to say to you today, you like sin. I like the sin of old. It feels good. It tastes good. It looks good. But the fact of the matter is, it is grave clothes and it does not do us well. So everything that looks good is not good. Everything that tastes good is not good for you. Everything that, that tastes good walks with you and, and things that are comfortable with you. God has to get our attention as Christians, as Christians, he has to get our attention so we can walk away from the grave clothes. So he said to us, in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, take it off. He says, he says take off that which is comfortable to you. Take, take off that which you like to do. Take off those grave clothes. Get away from your own sin. Leave sin alone. Leave the sin alone that you like. Paul says, put it off. Get rid of it. And tonight, we're going to talk about the fact that Paul says in verses 12 and 14 of Colossians chapter 3. He says, put some other things on. I said to you, Nancy Reagan had a good point. Children ought to say no to drugs, but she should have told them what to say yes to. I would be guilty as Nancy Reagan was if I say to you, take off anger. Put off wrath and malice. Take off blasphemy. Take off dirty language and not give you something that you ought to put on. So in verse number 12 through verse number 14, Paul says to us, put on some things. He says, he says, you have taken off the old man, so now you got to take off the old man deed. And you need to put on some things. Now, this coat in the weather is not as comfortable to me. When it rains, this coat gets, gets soaking wet. When the wind blows, this coat does not offer me good comfort. And when the, the sun is out, this coat does not shield me from the sun. But Paul says, take off the grave clothes and put on the grace clothes. So this coat, for the sake of the, the analogy, for the sake of the demonstration, this coat represents grace. It has nothing to do with the fact that it's a suit coat. It has nothing to do with the fact that it's a dressy coat. It's just a representation today. And it represent, represents the fact that we need to put on Grace clothing. Take off the stuff of old and put on the new. Let's see what it says in verse number 12, Colossians chapter 3. He's already told us that we have been enslaved to Christ. He said that Christ is in all and Christ is all. If the only thing you have is Jesus Christ, you have all you need. If all you have is Jesus Christ, you have all you need. 
Paul says, therefore, as the elect of God, Therefore, as the elect of God, this word elect means we are chosen. This word elect means that we are different. This word elect simply means that God has chosen us. We have not chosen him. We are the elect of God. We are the chosen ones that God has set aside and he has given us grace, and because he has given us grace, we have God's favor. God, in his grace, has given us favor that we do not deserve. God, in his grace, has given us mercies, has given us love, even though we are underserving sinners. God has done it. Paul reminds us of God's grace because our grace is not because of what we have done. Our grace is not because of the deeds we've taken care of. Our grace doesn't come because we give our tithes or return our tithes. Our grace doesn't come because we are baptized. Our grace doesn't come because we attend church services on a regular basis. Our grace does not come because we treat people right. Our grace comes, God grants us grace because of what Jesus has done over 2,000 years ago. He did it on a skull hill called Calvary. And because what Jesus did and we have accepted Jesus as our Savior and we ought to accept him as our Lord because of that one fact, guess what? We are walking in his grace. The text says, therefore, as the elect of God, because we are the elect of God, we have been chosen. We are the chosen of God. We have been given his grace. His grace has manifested itself in us. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, we are holy. We are set aside. We are different. We are, we are set apart. We are holy. We are holy because we trusted Jesus Christ. We are holy because Jesus has set us apart. Again, it's not because of what we've done. It's because of what Jesus did for us. He has set us apart. He has set us apart, and we are not our own. We are not our own anymore. We are not our own. We, we are not the one who ought to be controlling our lives, but Jesus should control it. Yes. We are not our own. We're set apart. We are set apart. We're different. We belong completely with, to Jesus Christ. We are set apart. We are different. The analogy here is given by the children of Israel while they were in Egypt. God's chosen people. They were ones that God set free from the Egyptian bondage. Let me just share with you. God has set you free from Egyptian bondage. In other words, God has set you free from the slavery of your sin and from slavery of the devil. God has set you free. He did it. You didn't do it. You didn't know how to do it. You're not equipped to do it. God has done it for you through Jesus the Christ. He has completely set us free. We are holy. The word holy means to be, to, to be consecrated. The word holy means to be set apart from others. The problem is we have Christians or Christians that don't understand what the word Christian really means. It is Christen. And as Christens, we ought to be Christ-like. And as we become more and more Christ-like, 
we show forth our holiness and we don't have to put it on display. God does it. We don't have to tell people we're holy. Just walk in holiness. And now being holy is not refusing to wear pants. Being holy is not refusing to wear makeup. Being holy is not refusing to keep the Sabbath. Being holy is a state of being set apart, sanctified, consecrated for God himself. We are sacred. We are holy. We are of God. Look at what it says. It says, therefore, as the elect of God, since you are the elect of God, since you are holy, and since you are beloved. This word be love means to, to love, be loved. Beloved means to be loved. We are beloved. This word is twofold in the Greek. First of all, it is the same beloved, the love. We get the word of unconditional love from the word agape. And secondly, it is the, where we get the, the condition of brotherly love, philia. So he says that God loves us as a friend. And God has unconditional love for us. And since we have been chosen, since we are the elect, since we are set apart because we're holy, since we are beloved of God in a friendly way and in an agape way, meaning in an unconditional way, then he goes on to say, put on some things. Look at what he says. He says, take off the old, as comfortable as it is, as nice as it looks, as dependable as it can be. He says, take it off and put on new stuff. So look at the text. It says in the text, put on tender mercy. Put on tender mercy. This word in the Greek, tender mercy. This word in the Greek is tender bowels. Bowels of mercy. It comes from the same word we get the word uh, intestines. A deep-seated innermost being. Put on your bowels of mercy. Put on Bowels of mercy, because he's going to tell us later on, God has forgiven you. He says, we ought to be people who will put on bowels of mercy. We should have an inner groaning to be merciful. Put on your bowels of mercy in such a way that you understand real well that you ought to be loving toward people and merciful. Put on kindness. Put on kindness. Put on goodness. It says put on goodness. Look for the good. Act out the good. Put on goodness. What would it be like if every time you looked at some Christians, they have nothing good to say, they have no good deeds, Paul says, put on the good. Put on kindness. Just put on humility. Put on humility. Be humble about this thing. Be humble. Be humble in such a way that you don't toot your own horn. The word humble comes from the same word we get the word submarine means to come and position yourself under. It is to submerge yourself under authority, under leadership. In this case, we ought to submerge ourselves under the authority of Jesus Christ. And as we submerge ourselves under the authority of Jesus Christ, we also submit ourselves under the authority that's over the earth. It is the word, we get the word submit. 
It is, it is where we get the word submit in Ephesians chapter 5, where I don't want the brothers to skip over, but it says, verses 21 and 24, Ephesians chapter 5, it says, submit yourselves one to the other in the fear of the Lord. So it says to us, as a man submit himself to God and the woman submit him, herself to, to the man and the, the children submit themselves to their parents, then and only then do we have a right relationship and a right fellowship with God. It says to be humble. Submit yourself to humility. Meekness. Meekness. Meekness is power under control. You didn't do that to that person because you were too weak to do it. You chose not to do it because you had power under control. The wise writer says it like this. He says, a man who has not control over his own spirit is like a city whose walls are broken down. There's no protection and there's no benefit for that man. So I say to you, brothers and my sisters, whatever you do, be meek and not weak. Be, be meek. Have some control, some temperance about yourself. Don't fly off the handle for every little thing that happens. Whatever you do, make sure that you get to a point in your life where, where you have some humility and you have meekness, that understanding that meekness is not weakness. It is power under control. It is saying that I have the power to hurt someone, I have the power to even kill someone, but because I have my power under control, how much more do we need the law enforcement to be meek? How much more, how much more devastating it would be if everybody in law enforcement lost their meekness? Thank God that somebody in law enforcement has meekness. Somebody has power, but that power is under control. We need people in the homes. We need people in the churches. We need people in law enforcement and in the military that has some control. Meekness. Power under control. And when we have power under control... We won't fly off the handle at everything and everybody. Then he says, put on long suffering. Put on, put on, put on long suffering. Being able to have a long fuse instead of a short fuse. It is kindred to, to meekness. In other words, being able to put up with something. If we had the generation that is living now, that was that would be the generation that would be living in the 50s. The African American race would be this extinct right now. The people who demonstrated in the 50s and the 60s were under control, and not only under control, they suffered long. And they were willing to allow God to bless them in their suffering. It's a possibility that when we, are, we have long suffering, we can let God handle our battles. We can let God fight our wars. We're not so quickly going off with wrong things for the wrong reason. We have a character that is long-suffering. Yes. We won't retaliate at every little thing that takes place. It is long-suffering. I do confess tonight that I got an issue that after I have suffered long, and then somebody still bags me up against the wall, 
I sometimes let go to meekness. What I'm saying to you and I say to myself today, we have to get to the point where we can suffer long, endure the suffering, have forbearance is the word. This word forbearance means that, that we, can, we can suffer long because we know that God is going to judge us one day. He says, says to us in verse number 12, have long suffering, put on long suffering. Verse 13, he says, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Bearing one another. When we are long suffering, we bear one another. We, we put up with stuff we really, really wouldn't, wouldn't normally put up with. He says we have to bear with one another, put up with one another, and we have to put up with one another from the heart. Because as we carry ourselves and we put on new things and we put on the new man, it is an identification of what's in our heart. God is constantly developing our hearts. And these things can lead to a better heart for now and for the future. So we have to be long suffering, we have to be forgiving. He says, bearing one another, forgiving one another. We ought to forgive because God forgave us and still forgiving us. The prayer that we teach our children, the prayer that we teach our children all the time is, is lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from all evil. And we also say to our children, say to God, forgive us our debtors. As we forgive, forgive me my debts as we forgive our debtors. In other words, God, as I forgive my debtors, you forgive me my debt. Yeah. The underlying statement here is if I don't forgive my debtors, you don't even have to worry about forgiving me my, my debt. Yeah, How many of us have really thought about that prayer? Have really thought about this model prayer that we see in Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. Starting off saying, glorify the Father in heaven first. Ask that God's will be done. God's kingdom be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then he goes on to say, forgive me our debts as we forgive our debtors. We ought to be forgiving people. Paul picks this thought up in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 where he says, love, all these things, love suffers long. Love is not puffed up. Love does not record that which is wrong. It's a shame some spouses are somewhere making a list and checking it twice. And they're writing it down on the calendar. And they're going to remind you when you, when, when I get a chance, I'm going to remind him, I'm going to remind her of the last time she or he did something that was wrong. I'm going to forgive, but I'm not going to forget. Let me tell you, when you forgive, you don't let it impact you in a negative way. That's right. When you forgive, you walk away from that impactful scene. You don't keep playing the video over and over in your mind. If you don't get past playing that same incident over and over, if you can't get past playing that same incident over and over, you have not forgiven. And if you feel the same way, hurt and destroyed and dejected and rejected, you have not forgiven. Because when you forgive, your heart changes changes with that person. It changes with that incident. Right. So as God has forgiven us, we ought to always forgive others. Amen. Bearing with one another. Forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so 
you also must do. Christ has forgiven us. How you know? Yes. If we're saved, we know Christ has forgiven us. And you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to note that even people who are not born again know that Christ has forgiven them. And they'll tell you. They'll tell you that I know that Christ has forgiven me. I know that Christ is the one who paid it all for me. And there are some carnal Christians, and he talks here about to these baby Christians, he talks here from a carnal standpoint and tells them, put off the old man, put on the new and keep him on. Yeah. In other words, we have to understand that as we are saved, we still have this war going on <laughs> within us. And there are some Christians that cannot and will not get past what somebody has, has done to them years ago. And you're holding up your blessings. You are holding people captive. You are putting people in jail, but you got the key. They can't get out. But the problem is you got to stay there and hold the key to keep them in. You matter of fact, you got to stand there and hold the door. You can't succeed. You can't go anywhere because you got to stand there and hold them hostage. The question is, are you holding them hostage or are they holding you hostage? Unforgiveness. Cancel out our blessings. But as God has forgiven us, we have to forgive others. And we need to forgive him. Forgive her. Forgive them as God continues to forgive us. And let me just tell you, every day of my life, I have to say, Lord, have mercy. My babysitter back home, Mary Lee Clark, she, had, she told us when she was babysitting us, every day of your life, you need to tell the Lord, Lord, have mercy. You need to ask the Lord for mercy every day of your life. I said, well, why is that? She said to us, because you need to understand that every day of your life is not good enough. Every day of your life, you mess up. Every day of your life, you fall short. And even if you don't know it, even if you do not understand it, ask the Lord for forgiveness. Ask God for mercy because you messed up somewhere. You thought something. You've said something. You've done something. You've acted some kind of way. I was in the line today at the pharmacy, and I was standing behind this young lady. She was two, two, two persons ahead of me. And, and, you know, I walk in, everybody's wearing masks. I walk in, and you can't see people's eyes and faces as clearly as you used to. And you sure can't see if they're smiling or not. And, and I thought the girl was really okay. I thought she was, she was really, I, I spoke, she spoke. I got in line, two persons behind her. But when she got to the counter, I could see the, the reflection of the the glass, I could see the reflection in the glass of her facial expression, even with the mask on. And I could see the eyes of the, the lady, the, the pharmacy tech behind the wall. And I could see the interaction. And I could tell that things wasn't going too well. Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you, there are some people that you don't want to upset. Mm -hmm. Number one is the person who cooks your food. You think I'm going to act crazy with Sister Davis and she going to cook something and say, hey, your meal is ready. <laughs> Not hardly. <laughs> the number two person you don't want to mess with, you don't want to mess with the person that's fixing your medicine. Mm -hmm. But this young lady didn't see it that way. She yelled at the pharmacy tech. She snatched stuff from the pharmacy tech. And then she looked at the pharmacy tech and said, may I get a bag, please? Mm -hmm. The lady gave her a bag. And she snatched the bag and walked out the store. Of course, the pharmacy tech wanted her job, so she couldn't say very much, but she just kind of watched her walk out the door. But I'm here to tell you, if the pharmacy tech had been another person of another race or of the same race she was, it would have been on like popcorn. I thank God 
that they wasn't of the same race. Because it really would have been on right there in the store. But she snatched the bag and walked away, and she walked away bitterly. She walked away sadly. She had a complaint. The way to handle a complaint in a professional way is to call for the manager. Speak softly. It says here in the text, if any has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgive you, so also you must do. We ought, to, we ought to voice our complaints, but we must do it in a dignified way. More than that, we must do it in a Christ-like way. And as we do it in a Christ-like way, God is able to bless us for the sacrifices we make just to demonstrate that we are Christian. We have to understand that in order to be Christ-like, we have to act like Christ. Verse number 14. The Bible says, for us to put on, above all, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Verse 14, for above all these things, what's, what's all these things? Above putting on gentleness, above putting on kindness, above putting on humility, above putting on tender mercies, above putting on long suffering, above putting on bearing with one another, above putting on forgiving one another, above launching a godly complaint, what I need you to do is put on love. Love covers a multitude of sin. Love does not behave itself unseemly. Love does not do folk wrong. Love is not puffed up. Love. He says, above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Yeah. Love is the most important of the Christian virtues. Love has a way of girdling everything together, and it ties everything together. Every virtue that I previously mentioned can be tied together with love. God has loved us and he has put it all together with love. It is the perfect bond. It is a bond of perfection. Love makes people walk in harmony. Love help balances us. Love helps us to grow. We need to make sure we exist in love. Say to the people at the New Beginning Church, you can't fake that you love people. That's right. You have to show that love. Yeah. We have to look for ways to love each other. Yeah. Look for ways to demonstrate our love to other men. Whether they're saved or unsaved, we have to demonstrate love. Even in our arguments, even in our complaints, we have to have that bond of perfection, that bond of love. We have to show them love. I said to you earlier, this love that God has for us is phileo type of love. It is the brotherly love, the love that a man has for another man, the love that man has for another woman, a woman has for another woman. It is the brotherly type of love. Hey, brother, you're my brother. I, you're not too heavy. You're my brother. It is brotherly love. And I also said to you tonight, it is Agape love. It is that love that ties us together. It is the, the unconditional love that God has blessed all of us with. And that love sets us free. It is a family type of love where we look out for each other in the family. Let me just share with you today. God is the ultimate love. God first loved us. And because he first loved us, we ought to love each other. Yes. We ought to love him. Can't you see Matthew and Matthew 22 saying, these are, these are the commandments that you need to keep. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. God demonstrated his love toward us. 
Romans chapter 5, verse 8. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died over 2,000 years ago on an old rugged cross. Jesus died for you and he died for me. That's love. He voluntarily gave himself for you. He voluntarily gave himself for me. He died on a cross. That's love. He died. They killed him and nailed him to the stick. He died on that cross. It was God demonstrating his love toward us. He gave his only unique son, his only begotten son for you and for me. Jesus died. And because he gave his life for us, we ought to be willing to put off the old man and put on the new. He died that day on the cross on a hill called Calvary. He died that day. They took him off the cross, laid him in a borrowed tomb. That's love. Jesus didn't even have his own tomb. Just like he didn't have his own bed after he was born, he didn't have his own tomb to be buried in. They laid Jesus in Joseph's brand new tomb mm -hmm. early that third day morning. That Sunday morning, he rose with all power, just like he said he, could, he would. He rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. And he did it with you in mind. That's love. He rose early that third day morning so you can be saved, so you can go to heaven. That's love. The songwriter says, Jesus went to Calvary. He gave his life for you and me. That's love. The songwriter says they hung him high and stretched him wide. That's love. He laid him in a tomb. He carried our sins far away. But early that third day morning, he rose with all power in his hand. Even that resurrection moment was his love that he was showing to you and to me. There may be somebody that's listening to me today that have never received or never confessed Jesus as your personal savior. So you really don't know, you really don't how, know how to comprehend this love I'm talking about. But this is your moment. This is your opportunity to get to know Jesus as your personal savior. You need to know him. You need to get to know him. You need to trust him. He is the only one who can get you to heaven. His love can make a difference. The door of the church is open. This is your invitation. Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14, that Jesus is all. And Jesus is in all. We want Jesus in you tonight. You can trust him today. Just believe the story that Jesus died for your sins. He was buried in a borrowed tomb and he rose again. Will you confess Christ as your savior tonight? Just join me in prayer and invite him in. Let him in today. Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you prayed this prayer, you're now born again. We believe that Jesus Christ is a part of your life and you are a part of his. We believe that if you die right now, you're going to heaven and not hell. If you prayed this prayer with me, will you let me know, inbox me and tell me so we can rejoice together. 
let me know that you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And for those of you who are not in church, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the captain. Where Jesus is the one who is the great head of the church. If you want to join the New Beginning Church, you can do that by inboxing me and let me know. we we'll get you all signed up. and You can be a virtual member of the New Beginning Church. And we look forward to the day where we can get together and fellowship with you. Many have joined throughout this land, whether near or, or far. We're looking forward to, to you joining the New Beginning Church as a member. And for those of you who need prayer, please contact me, inbox me, and let me know that you need prayer. We'll be glad to pray with you and pray for you. And those of you who just need to repent and pull off these old things, and put on these new things, inbox me and let me pray with you. And let, let us come together in prayer and, and get rid of these things together. Thank you so much for joining us here at the New Beginning Church from our remote location. Thank you for being a part of our service. Thank you for tuning in. We look forward to hearing from you. look forward to seeing you on a regular basis. It is now offering time. It's time for us to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It's time for us to give to the Lord. It's time for us to give to the Lord. And you can do so by three means. You can do so by cash app. Our cash tag is NBC Souls, dollar sign NBC Souls. Or you can do so by Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can do so by mailing in uh, your, your tithes and your offering to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our Bible study. We're here every Wednesday night at 7.20 p.m on Zoom as well as Facebook Live. Please join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Sunday morning for our Sunday morning uh, Sunday school at 9 a.m. Please join us at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning for Sunday school. And also join us Sunday morning for 1045 worship service, 1045 worship service every Sunday morning at 1045. Please join us. We'll be glad to, to rejoice with you and be glad to fellowship with you. This Sunday is our Communion Sunday. Um, I'm, I've asked that you um, come by the church and pick up your communion or you can continue to, to do your virtual communion at home without a sealed communion. We have sealed communion at the church. I'll be at church most of the day on tomorrow. Uh, please give me a call. Come by the church uh, between the hours of 10 and 5. Please come by. You can pick up communion um, sealed in the cup. You can pick up, up, up your communion on, on tomorrow. Uh, look forward to fellowshipping with you by way of communion on this coming Sunday during our 1045 service will be fellowshipping. Jesus says, for as often as you do this, you show forth my death and my suffering until I come again. So we want to celebrate what Jesus has already done for us through communion. Hallelujah to the Lord. Again, thank you so much. We'll continue to pray for our sick and our shut-in. We'll continue to, to lift up those who are impacted by COVID-19. We are, we are also praying for those who are sick from some other reason. Uh, God is the healer. He is the God of grace. He's the God of mercy. Keep putting off those grave clothes, putting off those grave situations, and put on grace clothes. 
so God can continue to bless us together. Thank you so much, those of you who have been financially contributing to our church. Thank you so much for continuing to contribute even though we're not in the building. It says that you are in con contact and in constant communion with God because you understand that ministry must move forward and ministry costs money. But above all of those things, you understand your commitment to Jesus Christ. No man has to pump or prime you to give to the Lord. Thank you for giving to the Lord since we've been out. Thank you for, for being a part of worship and giving is a part of worship. To those of you who have fallen off, let me just say to you, get back on the horse. <laughs> Get back in communion. Remember, you don't give to the Lord because you're at the church building. And you don't give to the Lord just to get blessings. You give to the Lord because you're fellowshipping with him and you have the right relationship with him. So if you have not been giving, this is a good time. Don't wait till your New Year's resolutions. They don't last anyway. Continue to give to the Lord. And those of you who have fallen off, go back and pick up and, and bring it to the Lord so the Lord can continue to bless you. He blesses. He promised that he will bless you. Will a man rob God? Yes, he have robbed them in tithes and offering. And because of that, we are cursed with a curse. But he says, if you bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, number one, there will be meat in my house. Number two, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. And you will be a delightsome land says the Lord of hosts. So come on, get back on board and come, come on and continue to give to your local church uh, that God will continue to bless us financially and bless us spiritually. And that's what God, we, God wants to do with us and that's what we want God to do with us. Amen? So thank you so much for, for being a part and continuing to give to the kingdom of God. So one thing about the New Beginning Church, you can always see where your tithes and offerings at work. So thank you for being, being a part of our worship through giving. Amen. And for those visitors who have been giving to us from a distant land, thank you. Thank you for, for continuing to give to our church and continuing to give to our ministry. God is pleased with your gift. Here at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, if I, if I, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for all that you do. Thank you for all that you have done. We ask you to bless us, Father God, that we will continue to walk in you, continue to put on those things that are new, continue to put on godliness and get rid of devilishness. Lord, Lord, we ask you, Father God, to continue to bless us, bless our church, bless our, bless our ministries, bless our households, and bless every person who will tune in and every person that will share this broadcast. Lord, we pray, we pray that you continue to bless us to give favor to those who we need to forgive and bless us, Father God, to receive favor from you. It's in the precious, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. To those of you who would, please, ma'am, please share this video. And whenever we come on, go ahead and start a watch party so people can, can witness and you can be a witness. Uh, as we are going from day to day to day, we got to stay six feet or more apart. We're not able to witness and testify of God's goodness as we usually do. But if you share this video and all other videos, go back and pick up on the rest of them and share those videos so you can be a witness. You are being a witness by your sharing that people will hear the gospel. Every time we stand at the New Beginning Church, people will hear the gospel and you can help the gospel go forward by sharing your video and by starting a watch party. I want to say to you, begin to start watch parties here at the New Beginning Church. Begin to share the videos with your family members and friends so God can be blessed. Until next time, thank you so much. Be blessed. God keep you and God bless you is our prayer.